Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather. Thanks for joining us again tonight. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. It keeps you and your community safe. You can do so easily by calling us at the Alaska Weather Information Line 1-800-472-0391. And if you're on St. Lawrence Island, you know the numbers right there with me. One, two, three. It's that easy. So learn your numbers and dial it up super fast, just like all the folks on St. Lawrence Island. Weather.gov slash Alaska is the easy way to find us online. One click and that should get you to your weather forecast. You can also get information about general aviation, flying weather, and icing and turbulence as well. You can get information about river ice and uh, snow amounts around all of Alaska if you want to check the water uh, supply there or just check the status of uh, your river in your backyard and the flow rates anytime. And of course, the general weather trends are always available as well as climate information. Uh, if you have any questions about what you're looking at or need help finding something, please let me know. I am happy to serve you any way I possibly can. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is the easiest way to find me online. As you look out west and through our, the Bering Strait and for our friends on St. Lawrence Island, Gamble and Savunga included, north-facing coastlines are going to have a little bit more wind as we go through the rest of tonight and into tomorrow. A winter weather advisory is in effect for the region right now. That's why we have it painted in yellow. And what that means is snow and blowing snow will be the primary issues that you're dealing with with those winds coming out of the north and gusting up to about 50 miles per hour tonight. You are going to see more snow, probably another inch or so as we head through the rest of the afternoon, the evening hours and into the overnight. Uh, probably not a whole lot accumulating anywhere. Of course, it will be blowing around as well. But visibility is going to suffer, and as such, that uh, does present a little bit of a hazard if you're trying to move around carefully and see where you're going. So uh, just be extra careful out there and pay attention to the weather. If it starts getting worse, just wait it out and stay inside. It should improve starting tomorrow. The other thing that we're worried about, and just slightly so, is that north wind again driving a lot of water towards St. Lawrence Island, and it could push some of the waves up to the top of the beach. It doesn't look like there will be any coastal flooding in any significant fashion, but a high surf advisory is in effect through the rest of the evening hours there, so pay attention to that as well. Now, the good news is, as we head into the next couple days, the winds will still be with you, but they're not going to be as strong. We are still looking at a north wind, though. That should take us well into the weekend, and here's why. Low pressure is sitting across the interior. It's moving across the west coast right now, and that is grabbing a hold of that cold air and pushing it southward, pulling it southward, in fact, across the Alaska Peninsula. As it does that, it is grabbing a tremendous amount of cold air and running that down the west coast. And because of that, more changes are occurring around the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Strait. You can't wait to see the sea ice analysis. A lot of changes here in the Chukchi, a lot of changes around here, the Bering Strait, and on the eastern side over as we look toward Asia and Russia there. So probably in not too long, we'll probably have a lot more ice around St. Lawrence Island. There are hints of ice forming on the south side of the island already. Now, as we look out in the Gulf, it's pretty easy to see the weather maker that will be affecting southeast in the next couple days. Take a look at this storm system here wrapping up in itself. A storm force low is developing and strengthening as we speak this afternoon and tonight. As this is moving towards southeast, moving ashore fairly close to Sitka later tonight and early tomorrow morning, it is going to pack a lot of wind with it. Now, we don't have any high wind warnings out for any parts of southeast at this point. But storm force winds are expected across the outer coast, and we're probably going to have some strong wind gusts through the region during the nighttime and early morning hours tomorrow. Pay attention to that, especially if you're in the inside passage. And as we've been watching this today, rain has been moving up across the southern half of southeast, and snow's been falling across the northern half. There's been thunder and lightning around Haida Gwaii, so this is just some part that is telling us uh, this is a fairly energetic storm, and it will continue to move eastward as we go into the next 24 hours. But what that does is it makes more room for the next system to come out of the North Pacific. And you don't really see much of it right here. We're getting a little bit of a hint of uh, some of the clouds on the western and southern side of your screen there. But this system is going to come moving very quickly across the western Gulf 
and deep into about 950 millibars. And this will become uh, the major players we head into the weekend for just about all of our southern communities involved as we start to send in more southerly winds across the Gulf, dragging in more colder air across the west coast in the Aleutians. And of course, in the meantime, send a lot of east and southeasterly winds across the chain. So here's how we get there. 972 millibars right now in the Gulf. That's that storm force low that is cranking up tonight. Rain in the south, snow in the north, and snow across south central, the Matsu. Kenai Peninsula, uh, even Kodiak Island seeing a little bit of precipitation there, and also into the upper Tanana Valley and the upper Yukon. This is your normal winter snow. Nothing terribly significant in accumulations, but it is just coming down and persistently so. So if you're ready for winter, finally in Alaska, South Central, uh, the upper interior, the eastern interior, and areas around the northern Gulf Coast seem to be the place to be for that today. The interior, the colder air is spilling in, and we also have low pressure sloshing in snow across the YK Delta and the Bering Strait. But this is also pulling in some of that stronger wind to St. Lawrence Island. A look to the west shows low pressure just south of the Provolovs at 993 millibars. A little bit of warm air hanging on around uh, False Pass and Cold Bay. Areas to the west seem to have enough for snow. And as we get into tonight, you can see that low pressure system kind of being absorbed in that main low across the west coast at 986 millibars. As we get into the overnight hours, low pressure will move ashore through southeast. Do expect to see periods of rain mixed with snow, but primarily it does look to be fairly cold enough for most areas to see at least a little bit of snow. Light snow will continue around south central in the Anchorage area. The Parks Highway, Sterling Highway, the Glen, all the way down to Homer, it looks like we'll see the opportunity for at least some light snowfall to occur. Colder air continues to pour through the Bering Strait. That will continue freezing up some of the ice there. Despite the amount of uh, wind there, it does look like temperatures are certainly ready for that to, uh, to continue to freeze. As we look out to the west, a 965 millibar low approaches the central Aleutians, and it's going to stay just to the south. At 963 millibars, though, this is going to be a, a decent storm uh, to bring in some east and southeasterly winds across Adak and Atka, probably out toward Attu Island. And this will have to contend with a very weak ridge before it moves a whole lot further east. But that should not be much of a problem because the high pressure system in the Gulf, replacing the storm force low that we'll have uh, late tonight and early tomorrow, uh, is not that strong and will quickly move out of the way. Low pressure is weakening here across Bristol Bay, but there will still be areas of snow around the Capes. And watch for a trough of low pressure to become uh, somewhat stationary there. The deepest, coldest weather of the winter so far is still holding on to the north, but not making it uh, terribly uh, further south toward places like Healy or uh, right up against the Alaska Range. So that means the upper Kuskokwim Valley probably won't be quite as cold as it could be around McGrath because of that. But along that boundary, it's a pretty good focusing mechanism for very slow-moving areas of light precipitation, so snow will st still be a possibility. And that's also going to focus some moisture in that area, so watch for pockets of poor visibility or lower ceilings in that vicinity. As we go into Friday, low pressure, the main one in the Gulf, it sits at 954 millibars. That is a, a decent storm for sure out in the middle of the water. And with that, we have a strong east and southeasterly flow with a moisture fetch moving up toward the northern parts of the Gulf, Kodiak Island, the Alaska Peninsula, seeing a lot of that wrapping around. And then you can see on the western side a decent northerly flow all the way from the Arctic, all the way south into the North Pacific. So uh, that is going to keep the wind going for places like St. Lawrence Island. It will keep areas of light snow going across many parts of the west coast, the Pribilovs for sure, but maybe, just maybe, enough warm air mixing in with some of that that it brings that rain and snow mix closer to the Pribilovs rather than just being all snow. Out across the west, a trough of low pressure sits on the western side of this entire storm pattern here. That should keep some light snow on the western side of the chain. Up across the interior, areas of light snow for the Copper River Valley, for the Kenai Peninsula, the Parks Highway System all the way through Matsu, uh, the Kenai Peninsula, the Kodiak Island region. It looks like everybody in South Central is still going to be looking at an opportunity for at least some light snow into Friday. It looks like Southeast could catch a little bit of a break. This, you know, all the way connected to here, this is a ridge kind of combining forces. Might really chop up and break up some of the clouds you have in the region for Friday. But don't be fooled. As we get into Saturday and Sunday, this storm still moving east on a pretty decent jet stream is going to start to bring uh, more clouds and more unsettled weather back into Southeast fairly quickly. So uh, 954 millibar low in the Gulf on Friday. That's, that's a big deal. As we look at temperatures in the morning, 
Lower to mid 30s for many in southeast. The northern end, Skagway, Haynes, you're looking at temps in the mid 20s, 24 in Yakutat. Teens and 20s for Prince William Sound. Low to mid teens for the Cook Inlet region, 20 around Kodiak, 8 below in Fairbanks, 4 below for Healy. 13 below in Fort Yukon, and 18 below for Arctic Village. Even colder for Anaktuvik Pass, anywhere from uh, 10 to about 25 below for the North Slope. Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, one of the colder spots. Nome, 4 below, 12 in Savunga. Single-digit temps for the west and southwestern coast. Bristol Bay near 10 degrees, 20s and 30s for the Alaska Peninsula. For your Thursday, it looks like most of the middle interior will probably be around zero, maybe just below. Nine below in Fort Yukon. Ambler and Bettles about seven below. Uh, Anaktuvik Pass 11 below, Utkiavik 9 below for a high temperature, 20s in south central, 30s for Kodiak Island, 30s and 40s in southeast, and the Alaska Peninsula near freezing. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On aviation weather now, IFR conditions should last across most of the YK Delta starting tomorrow morning all the way out towards St. Matthew, north of the Privlovs and uh, north of Nunavak Island. Down through the Alaska Peninsula, Sand Point and west and south toward False Pass and Cold Bay. And as you get a little bit further west of King Cove, you can start to see uh, conditions changing a little bit for the central and western Aleutians. Back to MVFR, really, that'll be fairly widespread for most of that basin. Uh, for southeast, look for an MVFR start. The southern areas down uh, south of Petersburg and uh, south of Craig, probably looking at IFR into the Dixon entrance there. North of that, though, all the way up to the Lynn Canal and Gustavus and Cross Sound, you're looking at a little bit more of marginal conditions there. Uh, south of the Alaska Range, northern Susitna Valley, and the upper end of the uh, Tanana Valley, just south of the Yukon, you're looking at MVFR, and then a widespread of VFR through your northern passes. The North Slope, though, looking at an MVFR start for Thursday morning, and that'll quickly turn over toward IFR conditions as the day goes on. So plan on changing conditions on the northern uh, slope, and then as you move south through the passes, MVFR at least through most of Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass. South of that, that should be maintained all the way through the Tanana Valley and the upper Kuskokwim, and then IFR lingers across some of your southwestern capes and north and including St. Lawrence Island into the Bering Strait. Southeast should see some improvements, but some of the higher train up through Lynn Canal in the capital city still looking at marginal conditions with IFR closer to Hyder in the Misty Fjords. As we get into Friday morning, IFR starts the day on the North Slope, especially around Utkiavik, east toward Point Barrow, uh, and uh, out toward, uh, uh, looks like just about Kaktovik before you really start to see a whole lot of improvement there eastward. It looks even better. Down around St. Lawrence Island and St. Matthew Island, expect IFR conditions. And around Prince William Sound in the Kenai Fjords region, also looking at IFR. As we get into Friday afternoon, southeast is looking pretty good there. IFR across Prince William Sound. Uh, general clearing there, taking shape across the middle and lower Yukon Valleys, the upper Kuskokwim, looking generally VFR. And then MVFR for most of Bristol Bay, Kodiak Island, uh, the Alaska Peninsula, and the chain. Let's take a look at your pass conditions in detail. Then it looks like we're heading over toward MVFR for Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass. As as we go throughout your Thursday. Lake Clark's probably going to have a little more trouble in the afternoon. Merrill Pass looks to hold on to VFR throughout the day. Rainy Pass heading toward VFR conditions as the afternoon goes on. Windy Pass likely, likely holds on to marginal conditions. Isabel Pass, we're going to go marginal most of the day. Mentasta Pass, probably marginal most of your Thursday. And Tanita Pass, also marginal. But as you go a little bit further south, looks like Portage Pass and the western side is going to stay IFR. And then you'll see actually better conditions on the eastern side. That doesn't happen very much, but that looks like that's what we're in for tomorrow for most of northern Cook Inlet. Chilkoot and White Pass looking at marginal conditions most of the day. No big changes on your freezing levels from yesterday. You can see that 2,000-foot freezing line just about up towards Sitka. Uh, everything north of that below freezing and the surface freezing line, not a whole lot further north than that, in fact, just uh, around Akiak and the southern end of the Kodiak Archipelago and out toward, uh, toward uh, the Alaska Peninsula and the central chain for that surface freezing line. So most of the state, obviously, sub-freezing. Icing potential is somewhat limited. We have a lot of dry air moving in, a lot of cloud cover, but generally speaking, a lot of cold and a lot of dry air setting in. So over the Gulf is really the main concern, above 4,000 feet, not over southeast, not over south central, and really Really limited across southwest and parts of the Alaska Peninsula in particular south of Cape Newham and uh, generally north of Port Hyden there. Out across the west you can see a little bit more icing returning in from the south. Uh, that's generally limited to areas above 2,000 feet. Here's a jet stream and that powerful river of fast moving air is coming in just pretty much due west. Uh, from uh, the Pacific at around 150 to 160 knots, taking a quick jog southward again across the Gulf and then back north across the extreme southern parts of southeast at around 100 knots. So it's really keeping the bulk of the big weather 
out of the region. But we still have some unsettled weather here across the northern Gulf because of this extra jet stream pushing in across the central and eastern Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula. It's still coming at 110 knots, so it's keeping things stirred up right here across the Gulf. And you'll see that at 9,000 feet. Here's our west and southwesterly flow into southeast, 35 to 40 knots. Southwesterly is into southwestern Alaska, 15 to 30 knots. Across the interior, 10 to 20, and the northerly is coming through the Bering Strait, about 10 to 15 knots. Similar conditions there at 3,000 feet. Light winds across the interior, west and southwesterly is picking up a little bit more for southeast at 40 knots. And then much stronger winds across the central chain from the east and southeast, up to 60 knots in many locations locations. What about turbulence? Really going to be hit and miss across the Bering Strait below 4,000 feet. We're going to watch the western end of uh, down toward Point Hope. A considerable moderate there. Same for the western end of the Seward Peninsula and uh, most of St. Lawrence Island. The chain below 4,000 feet hit and miss. Considerable moderate around Kodiak Island as well and many areas across the outer coast and southern parts of southeast. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm Dave Snyder, and joining me again is Cindy Preller. She's the Tsunami Program Manager for Alaska Region's National Weather Service. Thanks again for joining us, Cindy. Thanks for having me back, Dave. Sure thing. And I, I love saying Tsunami Program Manager for Alaska's National Weather Service because that's not weather. Why is the Tsunami Program part of the National Weather Service? Well, it's because the Weather Service absolutely rocks at warning people for every kind of, you know, devastating natural hazard. Mm -hmm. the, the mission of the Weather Service is to protect life and property. And so how does the Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer, Alaska, which is a very unique office, again, within the Weather Service, it's not weather, how do those folks help us protect life and property? The National Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer is a national warning center mm -hmm. and we analyze seismic traces 24-7 okay. all around the world. So when there's an earthquake anywhere on the planet, we see it and mm -hmm. analyze it within minutes. Within minutes and, within and there's minutes. actually a goal to have it under, was it five minutes? Mm -hmm. we, if there okay. is a tsunami warning to be issued for continental America, okay. um, yeah, we must get that out or wow. shoot to get that out in five minutes. Okay. Now, that, that's not something I have ever learned to do, so I know it would be a struggle for me to do that under <laughs> probably hours, but it is fascinating to watch, and, and the, the office is open on a regular basis for tours, right? Absolutely. Come by okay. Friday. Okay. Yep, every right. Friday at 1, 2, and 3 p.m., and they're open public free tours. And they're, it's the most interesting place on the planet. You really should check it out. Okay, and, and the, the, the office team is made up of of people that are earth scientists, not meteorologists or atmospheric scientists. Talk about some of the types of people that work there. Right, we are out of place in our <laughs> National Weather Service, but um, yeah, we are geologists, uh -huh. geophysicists, um, oceanographers, we even have an astrophysicist on board, mm -hmm. uh, uh, computer software architects, yeah. um, electronic technicians that are brilliant and innovative, our software is all written in-house, our instrumentation is designed in-house. Okay. So it's a really, really unique place, and it's just a couple handfuls of people that work there. So Sure. Yeah. One of my favorite ways to get a tsunami alert message is on Twitter. Right. And I can follow the, the Twitter address, and we'll put that up on the screen for you there. But it's usually a very quick message that tells you initially what the magnitude of an earthquake could be and about where its uh, epicenter was. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other ways that you can get that alert message? Well, I, Twitter's my favorite, too. Yeah. And you don't even need a Twitter account to receive right. it. So you, it right. just comes in like an SMS message. But mm -hmm. um, you can also receive it via email, mm -hmm. weather radio, of course, mm -hmm. um, the crawler on your television screen, mm -hmm. uh, on the Internet, Google Alerts, right. um, marine radio if you're out in harbors and boats. Mm -hmm. Actually, marine radio is probably... Yeah, that's a good one. That's our partnership with the Coast Guard. We're really yeah. grateful for that, yeah. absolutely. But there's a variety of ways in dissemination. Okay. And locally, excuse me, I'm sorry, but sure. locally in the communities, the sirens will go off as right. well. Right, right. So lots of different ways to get that very important message very quickly when, mm -hmm. that, when that matters to you. Uh, one of the ways that the, the warning center practices with communities is a test on a, on a yearly basis, right? Right. How does that work? Thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a controversial issue, but it's super important mm -hmm. to help us warn better and really serve Alaskans. Um, so the week of March 27th, the commemoration of the 1964 right. event, for that week we have a Tsunami Preparedness Week every mm -hmm. year. We like communities to get out and do drills and practice and, and do everything we can to raise awareness. And right. 
part of that is a live code test where we actually issue the warning message live and we activate the um, emergency alert system which means sirens go off the mm -hmm. TV crawler happens and it's a test 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 We're and doing everything that would normally happen without the real threat of the tsunami just to, right. to, to practice as much as possible right and this okay. is a major partnership with the state of Alaska mm -hmm. Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management the Emergency Operations Center right. and the Alaska Broadcasters Association without the media we wouldn't be able to do this so right. the three groups really work tightly together to mm -hmm to do our best to warn, educate the public that right. this is happening mm -hmm. so they don't wonder and get scared about it. Um, it has been remarkable what we've learned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it pretty much breaks somewhere every time, sure. but then we fix it and right. it gets better. So a, a quick example is just a few years ago, mm -hmm. we used to, when we issued a message, it would activate the entire state. Right. Right? I mean, Kotzebue, Nome, mm -hmm. Bethel, everybody would be in tsunami warning. And so now we can uh, regionalize it to where the actual event is taking place. Right. That's pretty huge. Right, right. So identifying points of failure and also points of success and making sure we continue down that successful path so that folks are warned as quickly and accurately as possible. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, to get our communities involved to prep themselves, prep their businesses, right. prep their tourism, prep their schools, you know, just make this a, a, an annual thing they need to be doing. Right. So as citizens uh, wanting to be prepared, we should be prepared to learn more about that test that's uh, happening usually toward the end of March every year. Right. And you should be happy that it's happening. Right. Instead of upset. Definitely be right. happy that it's happening. Right. Just, just as we test tornado sirens in tornado country, we also have to test the tsunami program as well. Right. Because there isn't enough time. You know, for right. a local tsunami, the wave will arrive in less than two minutes. So it's super important that people know what to do. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Cindy, thank you so much for helping us know more about the Tsunami Ready Program and the test and the Tsunami Warning Center. It's a very unique and very important job in the National Weather Service that is just fascinating to me every time I visit the office. So it's the only one for the continent. You really should come check it out. It's an international effort. Yes. Wonderful stuff. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Dave. And thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm Dave Snyder. We'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. On to your latest sea ice edge analysis now. As of the 12th of December, you can see a huge change in the Chukchi Sea. Just in the course of this week, enough cold air has been pooling in across the northern regions and diving southward. Of course, that's pushing some ice south into the Bering Strait, but we're also seeing ice growing eastward off of Russia. And as that moves closer to St. Lawrence Island, you can already see marginal ice zones there surrounding St. Lawrence Island, more substantial growth on the south side, and of course continued growth around Kotzebue Sound, Norton Sound, and all the way down the YK coastline. So winter is moving into the Bering Sea. In the course of one more week, probably six to seven days, there's a very good chance that a lot of what you see around the Bering Strait will be closed off. So watch for more changes, and you can always check it out yourself anytime, weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. On the southeast now, we saw that very large storm moving eastward, and you can see west and northwesterly winds moving along the outer coast as we go into Thursday. 35 to 40 knot winds there with seas as high as 23 to 26 feet. Gusts coming in from the southeast will reach up into the 35 and 40 knot range there with sustained winds anywhere from 15 to 25. Seas on the inside as low as 3 feet around the Lynn Canal and as low as tw or high as 12 feet around uh, the Clarence Strait region and into the Dixon entrance where they get much higher to 26, of course. For Friday, northerlies are coming down off of Sitka, out of Craig, anywhere from about 25 knots or so with 14 to 15 foot seas. And winds become a little lighter across the inside passages, 15 knots with three to seven foot seas there. A stronger southerly flow develops across the northern gulf as we get toward the end of the week. 20 knots to 25 outside of Prince William Sound, 14 to 15 foot seas are expected there. Westerlies across Prince William Sound on Thursday and blowing off of the Kenai Fjords region in the Resurrection Bay area. 20 to 30 knot winds with 11 to 13 foot seas. In Cook Inlet, expect 10 to 15 knot winds with the north and westerly direction there and 2 to 3 foot seas as we go through your Thursday. For Cook Inlet, as we get into Friday, north and northeasterly winds will strengthen. 
I expect uh, speeds around 25 to 30 knots or so, 6 to 9 foot seas, the strongest of which will be found just south of Kenai to about Homer. And southerlies, again, are strengthening across the northern Gulf with a much larger system developing across the western Gulf to 954 millibars. Easterlies develop in Prince William Sound after a day of westerlies the previous day. Four foot seas there on Friday. For Thursday in Bristol Bay, 15 knots and 8-foot seas coming in from the west. Expect similar conditions there as you move down the south, a little bit stronger. A westerly is coming off the Pacific coastline there, 15 knots inside of Shelikoff Strait, 40 knots east of Kodiak Island. You're looking at 18-foot seas there on Thursday and coming down to about 10-foot seas there with the easterly flow strengthening. Remember, our stronger system is now going to be south of the Alaska Peninsula at 954 millibars, so we're going to see a much stronger easterly flow moving into the region as we get into Saturday as well. But for Friday, 25 to 35 knots and seas as high as 10 to 16 feet as we go toward the end of the week. For Thursday, easterly is already moving through the region, 20 to 30 knots in most areas, 35 knots south of Adak and Atco with a 13-foot sea. 10-foot seas out in the west between Kiska and Attu and still holding onto a little bit of a north and westerly flow between Nikolsky and Unalaska with 11 to 13-foot seas there on Thursday. As we get into your Friday, notice we're still dealing with north and northwesterly winds here. Those stronger easterly winds still holding on to the northern Gulf. You can see that uh, happening across the Alaska Peninsula. Look for uh, northwesterly winds that are strengthening there, about 25 knots or so with 15 to 18 foot seas and 18 to 21 foot seas just south of the central and eastern chain for Friday. Look for northerly winds coming out of the Bering Strait down the west coast, anywhere from 20 to 30 knots, 25 knots and 11 foot seas for St. Paul and St. George on Thursday. Northeasterly is light over the ice in Norton Sound at 10 knots. A little bit more of a northerly flow on Friday. Winds are diminishing, but they're not going away. So that very gusty weather we've had around St. Lawrence Island, there will still be gusts in the region, but they won't be quite as strong as they have been for most of the week. North and easterly winds over Nunavak Island down toward the Pribble Offs, 25 to 30 knots and 6 to 9 foot seas there all ahead of the ice edge that's surely moving south as we get toward the next week or so. Northeasterlies across the Beaufort, 10 knots there. Northeasterlies over the Chukchi pushing ice further and further south, 15 to 30 knots into the Bering Strait with seas holding around 7 to 9 feet. As we get into Friday, winds really don't change a whole lot up north. As you get into the Chukchi coast, northeasterlies is still holding on to about 25 to 30 knots and 6 to 7 foot seas there. A quick recap of your weather tonight shows a strong area of low pressure across the eastern gulf that's moving ashore into southeast tonight carrying some strong winds with it. Areas of rain and snow should be expected. Cold air is still pulling southward on the west side of that low pressure system hanging out by the Yukon-Kuskokwim Delta. Look for areas of light snow around south central and most of the park's highway system into the Copper River Valley. Rain and snow continues for southeast, some light snow in the interior, and much colder weather for the west as a strong low moves into the western gulf for Friday. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal, pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.